The Tsaritsa, also known as the Cryo Archon, the god of love and the god of Snezhnaya is, without a doubt, one of the greatest antagonists in the entire game, both to Celestia and to the Traveler. Or is she? What if she isn't even around anymore? What if the Fatui and the Land of Ice are being ruled by Pierro without anyone being none the wiser? Bold claim, I know, but not completely unfounded. So let me walk you through my thought process and then you can take your own conclusions. Firstly, let us talk about the Tsaritsa herself. We know for a fact that she isn't the original Cryo Arkan, however, she has been in power for a while. Venti claims that he used to know her pretty well, but that fact changed 500 years ago. 500 years puts us back at the Cataclysm, which means two things. One, that Tsaritsa is older than that, thus predating the fall of Chondria, and two, the timing makes it seem like it was this event that turned her heart cold. Because that is what Venti is referring to. We have been told in several instances and by more than one character that the Tsaritsa abandoned her loving persona, despite being, you know, the god of love. This is what Dean Sliff had to say on the matter during the Travail trailer. She's a god with no love left for her people, nor do they have any left for her. Her followers only hope to be on her side when the day of her rebellion against the Divine comes at last. This surely paints an interesting picture of her. If Dane is to be believed, the atmosphere in Snezhnaya mustn't be the greatest. Yet, not everyone agrees with this. If asked, Tartaglia will tell you that Her Royal Highness the Tsaritsa is actually a gentle soul. Too gentle, in fact. And that's why she had to harden herself. Likewise, she declared war against the whole world only because she dreams of peace. This makes her sound a little less ruthless. Granted that him being a fighting addict and tainted by the abyss makes me question Charles' definition of gentle. Regardless, the gemstones always give us some clues about the Archon of their element. The Shivada Jade Gemstone, the Cryo One, presents us with dialogue straight from the Tsaritsa. It states, Sorry to also have you shoulder the grievances of the world. Since you could endure my bitter cold, you must have the desire to burn. Then burn away the old world for me. This quote never fails to give me whiplash. It starts with her apologizing, which is in accordance with what Tartalia said. However, she completely shifts gears afterwards. The Tsaritsa is on a warpath, and she's not above forcing people into the world of bonds, it seems. All so that she can burn away the old world. And here's our first big problem. The term Old World is used to refer to the Light Realm that the Seven Sovereign Dragon Lords inhabited and to everything pre Fainz's arrival. After the Primordial One descended, it defeated his sovereigns and created a human realm, thus establishing the New World. So, what exactly is the Tsaritsa even referring to? Does she wish to destroy the sovereigns that fled to the depths of the ocean? To destroy this new generation of them that is expected to be born? Does she want to destroy the Light Realm itself? Either she knows a lot that we don't, or it makes no sense. It's more likely that, by old world, she means the current system, in which Celestial rules over Tevat and is free to dish out punishments that the Tsaritsa deems unfair. At least, the actions of the Fatui seem to indicate that, considering that they are going around collecting all the seven noses and avoiding attracting the attention of heavenly principles, it would make more sense for them to be making a move against Celestia. Dane also specifically mentions a rebellion against the Divine. That said, the Tsaritsa might have meant exactly what she said. Her goals might vary wildly from those of the Vatui, and the collection of the noses might be entirely Pierro's plan. Though I want to point out that Pierro promises this his Signora that her final resting place would be the entirety of the Old World, so for what it's worth, I do think they are referring to Tevat as it is right now, which is to say, under Celestia's rule. Which still doesn't mean that he and the Tsaritsa are on the same page. So, what evidence do we have that Pierro is acting independently? The Jester was a royal mage of Conria, but due to him being considered less capable than the Sages, his advice wasn't heeded and the nation incurred in sin, being destroyed for it. This gave Pierro a pretty good reason for hating the Divine. Him being a mage and now immortal also gave him a pretty good starting point for his revenge. He had time, he had power, and he would get more. And thus, Pierro created the Fatui. Yes, created, not joined. He was the first of the Fatui and is still their director. Now, presumably, he would have done this under the Tsaritsa's orders. After all, the Fatui are subject to her, at least in name. Because literally every ploy of the Fatui had Pierre as its brain. He personally recruited Dottore and Signora and had Dottore recruit Scaramouche for him. He was the one to pin Tartali's delusion to his clothes. He orchestrated the distribution of delusions in Inazuma. 
He was the one to send Scaramouche in expeditions to the Abyss, and the one who sent him to Liyue in the first place during the Unreconciled Stars event. So we got Piero, 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 we decide of Piero, and literally no Tsuritsa. This doesn't necessarily mean she isn't around, though. She's a deity in charge of an entire nation. She may simply relegate military matters to the jester due to being busy. She may trust him to be a right-hand man. But if that is the case, then why not entrust him with their own noses? A Winter's Night Lazo allowed us to see a very interesting game of chess. This, in and of itself, spawned many theories and was described in depth by other people, so we will not be doing that today, especially because it's not central to this theory. Our focus is going to fall on two pieces and two pieces only, this black pawn and the white knight that captured it. There are a few things we are pretty sure of regarding this game, namely the Fatui are playing black and the fallen pawn is Signora, as one of her butterflies is seen landing on it. This led me to believe the white knight was a stand-in piece for Raiden's noses when the trailer first got released. However, Sumeru came to disprove this, as we got a clear look at said noses while it was being removed from Scaramouche's godly mecha suit. That is clearly a bishop. So who could his white knight be? It moves on its own, leaving behind a faint trail of cryo, which led many to theorize this is a Tsuritsa playing against Piero, perhaps to simulate Celeste's moves. But I think it's more literal than that. The Tsuritsa and Piero are actually on opposing sides. The cryo archon wasn't the one who killed Signora, but she's still marking her death as a small victory, as though the Harbingers were standing in her way. We see this disembodied cryo power manifest itself in a different way as well. During Signora's funeral, it completely encases the palace. Is this a Tsuritsa's way of showing grief, or is it showing hostility? Maybe she's trying to take them all out at once by giving them hypothermia. I'm joking, by the way. Mostly. Regardless, between the Tsuritsa probably playing white and the absence of her noses, it doesn't seem like all is well between the city and the Fatui. Think about it. At the time this trailer dropped, the Harbingers had only collected two noses. Venti's Queen and Zhongli's Rook, both of which are on the board. Yet the Cryo Noses is nowhere to be seen. You think that would be the only one that wouldn't even need to be collected, since it has, presumably, been in the Tsaritsa's hands this whole time. If she really trusts Piero enough to let him run the entirety of the Fatui, why not just hand her Noses in to be kept with the others? On the other hand, if the Harbingers are going around collecting the other six Noses for Her Majesty, why not actually give them to her? Somehow, because using them as decor is more dramatic doesn't seem like a plausible enough reason for me. And it's not just about them not handing their noses to their god, even the way they were collected in the first place seems incredibly personal. For instance, it seems like Signora was the assigned quote-unquote diplomat for the mission of acquiring the noses. She carried out this role for three nations before she got deleted. But the way she did it? She was actually diplomatic with Zhongli and the Shogun, even though there were strings being pulled behind the scenes in the second case. But with Venti, she went in to settle past grievances. She hated the animal archon for the death of her lover, Rostam, so she really got a kick out of abusing him. A very literal one! If you didn't know her backstory, it would look like she was just carrying out orders from the Tsuritsa. After all, Venti himself admits not having a good relationship with the cryo archon at the present moment, so it would be plausible for her to ask Signora to rough him up a little. But after Signora's death, we got Totore and Sumeru, and he took to antagonizing Nahida even prior to Rook Advaita's erasure, despite the Tsarissa being unable to have a grudge against her on account of her age. In this case, too, the doctor was settling past grievances he had with the academia. Again, it's personal. We don't know exactly what the Tsaritsa's supposed plan is yet, but if she really is making an enemy of Celestia, adding the other Archons to that list might not be the smartest choice. So why allow such differential treatment? Why afford Morax the choice to make a contract that benefits him in some way while mistreating a small, wise radish? It makes no sense when viewing things from her point of view, so all of these might have been decisions on the Harbinger's part alone, meaning they aren't really following any sort of higher power. We have been told they enjoy a great degree of freedom, but they might actually have full agency, as they might not be following the Tsuritsa at all. And how would they, when the Tsuritsa may not even be present anyway? You know how the Academia made Nahida prisoner in the Temple of Surastana? Something very similar might be happening in Snezhnaya, 
with Onahide being unable to leave, but still capable of impacting the outside world to some degree. The Tsuritsu not sitting across from the Jester, but still playing chess with him, might be the exact same thing. We have been told that the top three Harbingers are powerful enough to rival the gods. If they turn on her, they might have been able to imprison her somehow. Which then stems a huge question. Why? Why would things ever get to such a point? If we look at this from Pierro's perspective, it becomes way clearer. Remember that he saw the cataclysm coming, he advised against whatever Conria was up to, but Ermin, or perhaps an Alberic regent, whoever was in charge at the time, did not listen. Maybe his nation would still be standing if only those who ranked above him had listened to him. So, having someone still casting a shadow over him and overseeing his every move, passing judgement on it, might have been the last thing the Jester wants. Who's to say that Sadisa wouldn't be another Ermin such outbreak if he allowed her to do as she pleased? Surely, it's better this way. But also, devotion to the divine in general coming from a Conrian is dubious. The underground nation was godless and proud of that fact. To bend the knee to a god after the cataclysm would likely feel like the greatest form of betrayal, even if said god directly opposed those responsible for the fall of one's home. Meanwhile, love often goes hand in hand with compassion. If the Tsuritsa really was as enraged by the cataclysm as she was made out to be, her extending her hand to a refugee and lowering her guard wouldn't be surprising. Both of these factors might have come together to create the worst possible outcome for her. How would the Tsuritsa's absence be explained away, though? Well, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it doesn't need to be. Because as far as the common people and even some of the Harbingers are concerned, she's still around. We know from one of Tartali's character stories that the Tsuritsa was present when he was given his illusion. He even describes her gaze as cold but pure, arrogant yet sharp, and recognizes her as a true warrior. So there's clearly someone, or something, at least vaguely Tsuritsa shaped somewhere in Sejnaya. Which is to say that we might have another A vs Raiden Shogun situation in our hands. There may be a puppet sitting the throne. And this is where Sandrone comes in. She's said to always be engaged with her automatons, like the thing that follows her around. But not all of her robots look, well, so robot-like. We know that the Catherines with an S are robots from Sejnaya. The Adventurers Guild is also incredibly suspicious, and it is in a position that allows them to collect all kinds of intel all over Tevat, without having to act under the constraints of diplomacy, unlike the Fatui. I think it's highly likely that Sandrone is the one behind the production of Catherine, and with Adventurers Guild acting as a secret branch of the Fatui. If this holds true, then the Seventh Harbinger is capable of making very human-like automatons. What's more, puppet making has its roots in Conria, so it's possible the Jester has imparted this knowledge to the Marionette. We still don't know when, where or why she was recruited, but this is a possible reason. Sandrone might have simply been a brilliant engineer, maybe under the Fontaine Research Institute. I'm calling it now, we will face her in Fontaine. And Pierrot may have recognized how useful she could be. Let's say she did make it Tsuritsa puppet. That explains her sudden... cold shoulder. I'm sorry, I just pulled the scene. There is a very noticeable difference in personality between A and the Raiden Shogun. While Hei has a lot more hidden warmth, the Shogun was programmed to follow a set of instructions and so she does. She's much more dispassionate, logical and ruthless. For a gentle god of love to wage war over the suffering of so many people isn't weird. How many wars haven't been fought in the name of love after all? But for her to become so cold even to those she wishes to avenge is. Even the Wanderer says people praise her for her kindness and benevolence. Both descriptions are so at odds with each other. This sudden shift could be explained by her getting replaced by this hypothetical puppet. So if this is true, who knows about it? The top three Harbingers are almost definitely in the know. So that's Piero, Dottore and Colombina. We have seen Dottore work directly for the Jester, but we haven't seen much of the Damselette yet. Still, given her rank and eerie presence, this is probably a safe assumption. Then there is obviously Sandrone and Signora, as she was the one going after the Noses. Oh, and speaking of going after the Noses, Jean Gli may also know. He has this one suspicious line where he starts talking about the Tsaritsa only to cut himself off with a sad sounding sigh before completely changing the topic. This contract he made might have been aimed at somehow increasing the freedom the Cryo Arkan has. Not at freeing her completely, because Pierrot wouldn't agree to that. The Cryo Aura we saw might have been the result of what Zhongli bargained for, but that's pure speculation. 
As for the rest of the Harbingers, Polchinella probably knows as well, given his presence in the Travail trailer, which means he will play a big role in Seshnaya. Capitano, Arlecchino and Pantalone are more of a gamble, but I wouldn't put it past them to be in the know. There are only two Harbingers that I think we could say for sure don't know, Scaramouche and Tartaglia, for multiple reasons. They are playable and willing to spill the beans to the Traveler about the inner workings of the Fatui. They are plot devices meant to advance our understanding of the story. However, revealing too much at this point wouldn't be ideal, but neither of them has a good enough motive to keep some things concealed. Thus, it's more likely for them to be in the dark as we are. But even from a lore perspective, these two were always outcasts within their group. Scaramouche only came to join the Harbingers because of the deception and treachery of the Doctor, and after taking the role of the Balladeer, he became a subject of said Doctor and a pawn of the Jester, who sent him into the Abyss due to his resilience as a puppet. Even his learning about the fake stars was probably not purposeful, thus it would make no sense for Pierrot to come clean to him. Meanwhile, Tartaglia is the errant boy of the Harbingers, who purposefully sent him away on missions due to his troublesome nature. But there is a bigger problem with Child his genuine devotion towards the Tsaritsa. His god and his family are the most prized things in his life. He would not take her imprisonment well. Which may be exactly why Polchinella is making every effort to get closer to his family. Child genuinely thinks he's a good man for this, but we have no real precedent of the Harbingers caring for each other and even the Wanderer thinks this is a ploy. If Child does find out and gets out of line as a result, his family would be the perfect incentive to get him to bow his head down and submit to whatever he was told to do. Alright, now that we analyze this from amidst the sea of lore, let us take a step back and look at the broader story, as it gives us another supporting point for this theory. So far, there has always been some deceit around the identity of the Archons. Barbatus first introduced himself as a simple bard, Morox as a random but knowledgeable mortal while faking his own death, Beelzebul, as far as the people are concerned, is Baal, and there was the whole thing about it not being determined whether the figure on the Dendra statue of the Seven was Nahida or Rukadvada, and after the cleansing of Erminsul, most everyone now believes that both of these entities are one and the same, just Boer. So, if this pattern holds, we will keep on having some misunderstandings regarding the identity of the real Archons going forward, that Saritza Puppet would fit the bill. With that being said, I do want to point out some counter-arguments. In the description of Mocking Mask from the Pale Flame Artifact set, Pierrot pledges his loyalty and devotion to the Tsaritsa and does something to the same effect during Signora's funeral, though in both of these cases he had an audience, so this may all be for show. What's harder to explain away, however, is the jumbled timeline. When the Wanderer talks about the Tsaritsa's kindness and benevolence, he does so in the present tense. But Thane's and Child's description are also in the present tense, and they are either a middle ground or the complete opposite. So what is going on in here? How come the Wanderer came to the conclusion that people of Snezhnaya love their ruler? Did he ever meet the real Tsaritsa? It's all very confusing, as Genshin's timelines tend to be. But these are not necessarily deal breakers. So it comes down to whatever you personally believe. Is Pierrot actually a devout follower of the Tsaritsa, or is she just another pawn? I'll let you decide. That's all for me today, my name is Blue and I'll see you again soon. Safe journey, travelers!